you might have seen the Open the Schools discourse. You guys like that? Open the schools! I mean, that's how these people sound. Uh, it's also weird. It's a weird thing to be yelling, too, by the way. Uh, when there's a very few schools that are actually closed. I think the only uh, full citywide closures were Chicago, I think. Maybe there was uh, another city or two. Uh, but there were uh, a few school districts, like in New Jersey or something, that closed. But other than that, there has been no widespread school closures. So uh, to answer those open the schools, people, uh, the schools are open. Uh, but, but if you were watching cable news or reading any sort of news outlet, you might be confused to hear that the schools are open because all of them are acting like these greedy, selfish, lazy teachers that are part of the teachers' unions are trying to slack off and work at home or work remotely, not have to go to school and teach your kids in the middle of a pandemic. I mean, just look at... The, I want to watch a large portion of this clip from CNN. Just look at this CNN clip from CNN Newsroom. It's like their morning all-news show. Uh, the host this Saturday... I don't know if he hosts every Saturday, but the host this Saturday was Michael Smirkanish. Uh, let's, let's take a listen here to what Michael Smirkanish had to say on CNN Newsroom this past Saturday. The COVID kids are not all right. I'm Michael Smirkanish in Philadelphia, and I'm worried about COVID kids. Now, what, what are COVID kids? I mean, if you were to just say the term COVID kids to me, I would assume that we're talking about children who have been tested positive for COVID. And not just that. Because I'm sure there are a lot of kids who tested positive for COVID. But if you were to call someone a COVID kid, I would assume that we're talking kids who got very sick and ill from COVID. And I would love to talk about them. Because I think it'd be important to talk about them. To learn about the children that got very ill. Even the ones who died during the pandemic. I mean, not enough of attention has been paid to them, to be quite honest, because the whole discourse around kids and COVID is that, hey, the kids aren't getting sick. The kids are immune, which is not true. They certainly don't get as sick, thank God. And they certainly don't spread it as much as older age groups, again, thank God. But to act like they just are like, uh, it, they're like... Uh, uh, they're rubber and COVID is glue. Uh, to use some uh, school language here. Uh, but uh, let, let's see. Look at, the, look at the thing here. Look at the thing here. Let me, let me remove myself for a second. Let me remove myself for a second. The Chiron is what have we done to our kids? Again, I'm going to assume that um, what have we done to our kids during COVID? I'm going to assume... Um, their parents and grandparents, a number of them have probably died. That's horrible. And why did they die? Because various mistakes and probably not all, you know, some of that, you know, sometimes you can't mitigate and stop everything, but certainly some of them probably had parents or grandparents or brothers and sisters or aunts and uncles or family members and friends of some sort who had to go to work because they worked at a grocery store or somewhere and they went and got COVID and Got very ill, maybe passed away. Uh, we could be talking about the uh, the financial aid that we barely gave in this country. Uh, I think it was uh, two or three stimulus checks over a two year period. Um, the uh, the the co the the child tax uh, checks that uh, you received if you had a child under the age. A five, you got 200, I believe, and under the age of, uh, uh, I don't remember, under, uh, once they hit six, excuse me, they would get 150 or something like that. Um, I have two kids, so I did get it. It was very helpful to have that extra money, but of course, when the year went by and they didn't renew uh, the Build Back Better, I mean, they didn't pass Build Back Better, which would have renewed those tax credits, uh, 
that went kaput. So there goes that extra money for the children. Um, is that what we've done to our kids? Hmm. Is it that we cut off uh, the extra unemployment for their parents so that they wouldn't starve if they lost their job or couldn't work during the pandemic? Is that what we've done to our kids? I don't know. Let's listen to Michael Smirkanish of CNN and see what have we done to our kids? What is he talking about? That's my label for those coming of age in the midst of a pandemic. They're bearing the brunt of COVID, even though most infected children are at much less risk of becoming severely ill. It's a tough time to be young and on the verge of a personal and professional launch. Rises in depression, anxiety, and suicide attempts, all facing today's youth, accelerated by the impact of remote learning. What? What? There has, I am, uh, first of all, this is literally like what I debated about with Michael Tracy. What he's whining about, what Michael Smirkanish, an anchor on CNN is whining about as the COVID kids he's talking about and whining about are the kids who missed their prom or had to do like a drive-by graduation. I have a, a, a brother who's 10 years younger than me. And he graduated from college and didn't have a graduation. He doesn't give a shit. Uh, my, my son had his kindergarten graduation, six years old. Uh, I guess when he was in kindergarten, he was four or five. Uh, four. Had his kindergarten graduation in 2020. A drive-by graduation. I mean, I could tell you right now, it did that sucked, but that's really more for the parents. A kindergarten, you think I don't remember my kindergarten graduation? Do you? He doesn't give a shit. Uh, I I didn't even go to my prom because who cares about that? That's the lamest thing in the world. Like, listen to what he is complaining about here. And then let's move on to the suicide attempts. I mean, there have been studies that have found that, sure, there were a documented rise in, I guess, suicide attempts. But the weird thing here is that the studies found that the suicide attempts in boys, that sort of was level. And that the suicide attempts in girls shot up. Now what that tells me is there's certainly some sort of flaw with this study or studies, whatever they were. It was a CDC study. The increase started in May 2020 with a particularly alarming spike among girls aged 12 to 17 from February to March 2021. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. This study is bizarre because in February to March 2021, kids were back at school. And second of all, the flaw that I'm talking about is that why would this specifically affect girls between the ages of 12 to 17 only why would they only document that surge it sounds to me like something was is wrong with the study did boys not lock down did boys not quarantine did boys not do remote learning did boys not get the memo but by the way this was attempts i should say um Actual suicides, I believe, stayed the same, if, if, if I recall reading. Here from the Atlantic, the suicide wave that never was. The notion that lockdowns increased the rate of death by suicide last year has become common knowledge. It's not backed up by data. <clears throat> And it basically goes through 
how there were no spikes in teen suicides. Kids are back in school in New York City and in D.C. where students were required to produce a negative test result. But this week in Chicago, the third largest school district in the country, the teachers union voted to refuse to show up for in-person work, upending school altogether and these kids' lives. Tuesday, the second day back from winter break, Chicago public schools reported 422 new cases among students. While that's reportedly the highest in the school year, the district has more than 340,000 students. This translates to roughly 0.1% of the student body. That shouldn't bring everything to a halt. Thousands of... But, but have you listened to what the teachers union in Chicago was claiming? It wasn't just about the number of cases. It was that... There was huge spikes going on. So I guess that part's about the number of cases. And none of the things that they had previously asked for to mitigate COVID was given to them. They had issues with ventilation. That was never fixed. They had issues with, uh, I believe, uh, PPE. They never got what they needed. Like, and they're coming back from a, they're coming back from a multi-week vacation, winter break, Christmas break, whatever it's called in schools. I don't remember. So those 422 cases, if those kids don't stay home and they go to school in that 340,000 student district, school uh, district, then it will spread. And then a lot more than 422 kids in Chicago public schools will have COVID. Other schools around the country have delayed a return to in-person learning. Cities including Atlanta, Milwaukee, Cleveland, and Detroit have switched to online learning or postponed reopening. What happened to the funding that was supposed to alleviate all this? $130 billion of coronavirus relief funds were earmarked for ventilation in schools and social distancing in classrooms. And $10 billion more was set aside for testing in schools. I agree. What happened to it? Certainly didn't go to the ventilation and everything needed. Have you ever been to a public school? Horrible ventilation. It's well known for that. I mean, part of the reason schools are off in the summer is because they, they can't properly ventilate for the heat waves. So what have we done to our kids? As this New York and I want to also add, the teachers unions and the teachers themselves would have no say over those billions of dollars. You should be asking that question to the federal government, to the state government, to the citywide governments, to the local governments, to the school districts. Line puts it, no way to grow up. For the past two years, Americans have accepted oh, this, more harm this is one to those... children in exchange for less harm to adults. I want to add something here. I want to add something here. As a parent of two young children who are in the age groups here that Michael Smirkanish is complaining about, and as a millennial, 35-year-old millennial, who graduated in 2008 into the recession, I want to say, this is, this is a hilarious line. For the past two years, Americans have accepted more harm to children in exchange for less harm to adults. I would like to extend that. It's not the past two years. I would like to say for the past, I don't know how many decades, Americans have accepted more harm to the upcoming young generations in exchange for less harm to adults. I want to say at every turn, at every turn, those in power have hurt millennials, 
and Gen Z, and I even want to extend that to some younger Gen Xers, for their own comfortableness, for their own monetary gain. I didn't hear any of this shit for my generation graduating into the recession with no job prospects. I didn't hear any of this shit for the millennials and Gen Zers who are the older Gen Zers who are talking about how, you know, I, I will never be able to afford a home. I will never be able to get out of debt. I will never be able to pay off my student loans. Where the hell is this empathy for any of those young people? Because I can tell you, you're crying and whining about the kids of today losing out on their proms and their graduations and whatever else you're crying about. It means nothing to what they're going to lose out on in terms of what they were promised about going to school, getting an education, going to college, getting a job, and then the American dream is yours. Then you're not going to get any of that shit. So I would say that once again, once again, Americans are accepting more harm to children in exchange for less harm to adults, even in this scenario. Because in this scenario, the adults are the ones complaining about the remote learning. Because what it really is all about here is they want their kids in school so they can go to work. Now, I know, I understand there are working class families with working parents who, you know, they work service jobs or blue collar jobs or on site jobs. And I totally get that. I totally get that. But the people who are writing these uh, articles and are going on television, that's not those people. I would love to hear from those people. People who you see on TV and writing these pieces, they're the professional class people who just don't want to fucking deal with their children, to be quite frank. Honestly, come on. This is like ridiculous. This is ridiculous. The greed that older people, older Americans have had for years, generations, decades. That was never an issue then, that they were harming the younger generations. But now that the harm to younger generations that they claim, the harm, is actually affecting the parents, the adults this time. All of a sudden, it's an, oh, give me a break. Included in statistics cited by its author, David Leonhardt, among third through eighth graders, math and reading levels were all lower than normal this fall, according to NWEA, a research group. The shortfalls were largest for black and Hispanic students, as well as students in schools with high poverty rates. Oh, you know how you fix that? You fix the poverty problem. Hmm. Hmm. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, the, the inequality in how black and Hispanic students in areas with high poverty rates, the inequality that's always been there. This isn't new. This isn't a COVID thing. All of a sudden, though, when you could make it a COVID thing, now we're talking about it, right? On top of that, the non-academic aspects of school, lunch period, extracurriculars, sports, assemblies, plays, trips, they've all been curtailed or eliminated. Who gives a shit? Who cares? Like, come on. And I say this as, a, as, a, as the, the father of first grader. You don't think I miss the school plays, the school concerts, the graduations, the, the, the bring your parent to school day, the, 
the have your mother come in, your mom come in for Valentine's Day lunch, all these little special things they do with kids who are young. Yes, of course. But again, this is for the adults. Kids don't care about that shit. I don't remember any of that shit from when I was a kid. My son's not going to remember doing the shit he has done, nor is he going to remember the shit he missed because he missed it. And it's not going to affect him one iota. I'm worried about kids being educated remotely and losing out on a whole host of social dynamics. I will say, I will say again, my son, this happened when he was in pre-K. In 2020, he was in pre-K. And I could see a four to five-year-old kid needs to socialize, interact. It's, it's, that's the point of school at that age. Even I would say up to first, second grade even. I mean, obviously it's more academic now. They do math and all that stuff. But in kindergarten, pre-K and kindergarten, it's all about socialization skills. And I could see it was, you know, it definitely was affecting him. And I could understand how kids with socialization issues to begin with or other, uh, you know, issues. I could see how it could have been hard on them. Sure, sure, sure. But, you know, we had to deal with it. Every generation has had their own issues that they've had to deal with. I mean, did any of these people care how these children would feel in, in how the, 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 the kindergartners, first graders, second graders, eighth graders, seniors in high school, did, did any of the Smirkanish or any other senior anchor ponder how the K through 12 students of 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004 would feel going to war with their country, going to war with their parents or other family members being sent off to war, their brother or sister coming back in a body bag. Was there any caution or worry about that and how that would affect those children? How that would fuck those kids up? What about the parents who lost their jobs when their kids were in school in 2008, 2009? Anyone worry about those kids? No. No, of course not. Of course not. What about the kids of today who already had to have uh, mass shooting drills? Anyone care about how that fucked them up? How hiding under their desk and pretending there was a mass shooter in so they could be prepared for when a mass shooter actually did come into their school? Anyone come to think about how that shit messes them up? It's just unbelievable. Just unbelievable. They're really acting like there's, like COVID is the first thing to ever be detrimental to children. And I'll tell you why. They're acting like that because, let's go back to that New York Times article, this one's affecting the adults directly. The effect to kids didn't really bother them for the other things. I mean, those events probably affected them directly and that's how it messed up the adults. But this one, the kid effect, has the domino effect for the adults. What you can't get in the remote world are the life lessons, the human interaction, the forging of relationships. And then there are the slightly older members of what Dr. Gene Twangy calls iGen, the ones who graduated from high school or college without the pomp and circumstance of a traditional commencement ceremony, the ones that have missed out on social interactions that I mentioned and benefited from, riding the yellow school bus jockeying for certain lunch tables in the cafeteria, playing after school sports. Many are now beginning their first jobs, but without the close contact and mentorship of a colleague or on-site supervision of a boss. Hey, I can tell you it's nice to fucking graduate into a job. Lo oh, I love this. I love this so much. I love it. Give me a break. The graduations they missed. Who who drives the school bus, by the way? Who drives the school bus? 
Who drives the school buses that he brought up? Those are the kids who aren't going to get COVID? Or those mostly older working class, from my own experience, at least in New York City, mostly uh, minority groups? Older, older uh, black, Hispanic, Asian gentlemen driving those school buses, at least in New York City, from my experience. They too are missing out, losing the nuance that no Zoom or email or text can provide. Having participated in countless online meetings in the past two years, I know I'm a different person when things are being recorded. More stilted, less natural, and yes, sometimes that's a good thing, but it's not a fair reflection of a real back and forth. They're deprived of on-the-job collaborative efforts, not to mention the camaraderie of social time with coworkers. When I first began practicing law, I learned more from watching colleagues try cases than I did from sitting in lecture halls for three years in law school. Work habits are not being fully formed remotely. Somebody needs to tell today's new hires what it means to be on the clock. That bro What is he going on about here? What? Oh, and dude, or inappropriate ways to communicate with a superior. Whoa, whoa, so whoa, whoa. I, I shouldn't have paused it there. This is hilarious. Here's what it means to be on the clock. That bro and dude, or inappropriate ways to communicate with a superior. And who? Who? What? Are you being serious? Are you being serious here? Is this a real? Is this a? Is this a real thing here? Is this, is this a joke? We need students in high school and college. And we need all the adult staff in there. So kids know not to go to their job and say bro and dude. What? What? Are, are we being for real here? Th these 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 are the COVID kids we got to talk about the ones who are saying bro and dude. Would you would, would Michael Smirkanish like to tell uh, the children to uh, pick the pants up to their waist and wear a belt or something like that? Too is that where we're going with this too? This is this is unbelievable. Sometimes you just have to say yes, suck it up, and get the job done. These elementary students in Chicago who missed this past week of school, the high school and college students who have missed social and sports and academic milestones, and the new hires who are not picking up normal work practices while remote in their living rooms. They are all COVID kids, and they are not all right. And any time that society is contemplating a response to COVID, their needs need to be prioritized. This is just un. Unbelievable. Just unbelievable. What a bizarre rant here. What an absolutely bizarre rant here. And I, I, I let's listen to that last part again, because I can't even, like, I, I honestly, I, I'm just so. Students who have missed social and sports and academic milestones, and the new hires who are not picking up normal work practices while remote in their living rooms. They are all COVID kids, and they are not all right. I mean, at any time that society is contemplating a response. I mean, first of all, he, he's really, really targeting a very specific group of recent graduates, isn't he? I mean, a lot of recent graduates end up going directly into, like, retail or a service job. They don't get to work in their, uh, the industry that they majored in. Some never get to. Some change uh, career trajectories completely. I mean, I can tell you right now, when I graduated in 2008, the last thing I thought I'd be doing uh, was, the, I mean, the last thing only because it didn't even really exist. Uh, I, I didn't think I'd be sitting here talking to a camera uh, about politics. I can tell you that much when I was uh, at film school. 
I mean, luckily there's a camera here, so I can uh, I can uh, finagle it and say that I uh, you know I'm sort of working in my field. I'm on camera, but uh, there was no live streaming career path when I graduated from college in 2008. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. 